Spirit of living God, we come before you in Jesus' name, thanking you, Lord, of course, again, for just your love, your grace, and your mercy. And Lord, as always, when we get into your word, we do ask for edification, conviction, challenge, and change. And we praise you and we glorify you in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so we are, as Willie so elegantly put it, finishing Second Kings. All right, we are um, in 2 Kings 24, 17 through the end of the chapter 25, 30. <clears throat> um, this is called the Lord's Restoration. So um, you guys remember, and I gave you guys a little thing with the last five kings of uh, Israel. And actually, the last four were uh, Josiah's three of Josiah's sons, and one of his grandsons. And so we saw uh, last, the week before last, uh, Jehoahaz. Uh, he was a king, and um, he got to reign for three months, and the king of Egypt, Pharaoh Necho, came and carried him away to Egypt, and I don't know if he killed him there, but he died there. But he made another son of Josiah uh, king, who was Jehoiakim, and Jehoiakim was evil, uh, he ruled for like 11 years, I believe. And uh, when Pharaoh Necho lost the battle to uh, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar came and uh, introduced himself as Jehoiakim's new ruler. And then Jehoiakim decided he was going to rebel. And I don't know, he got through over the wall and drug out of the city like a dead donkey. And so the people made his son Jehoiakim king. And he got to rule for three months and he decided it was best for him to surrender to Nebuchadnezzar. So he got carried away to Babylon. Now remember, Nebuchadnezzar came to Judah three times and carried the people away. So we've seen him carry him uh, twice. The first time in the first deportation, that's when Daniel got taken. Okay, then after Jehoiakim, the, the, the grandson of Josiah, was the king for three months, he surrendered, and that was the second deportation, and that's when Ezekiel was taken. Now, we are coming to verse 17 of chapter 24, where... Um, Josiah's last son is going to be the king. So, you guys, did I lose you? I wouldn't lose you. All right. So, verse 17. Um, Jehoiakim, Josiah's grandson, ruled three months, got taken away along with Ezekiel. Verse 17. Then the king of Babylon made Mataniah, Jehoiakim's uncle, king in his place, and changed his name to Zedekiah. Zedekiah was 21 years old when he became king, and he, re he reigned 11 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name was Hamatal, the daughter of Jeremiah of Libna. And he also did evil in the sight of the Lord, according to all that Jehoiakim, his father, had done, uh, his, his brother, for because of the anger of the Lord, this happened in Jerusalem and Judah, that he finally cast them out from his presence. Then Zedekiah rebelled against the king of Babylon. Okay, so Mataniah, um, it means a gift of Yahweh. In this case, Mataniah was made the king of Israel, which was to him a gift of of Yahweh. God made him the king, which was basically a gift to him. But he chose to follow the, the path of wickedness. So God judged him and the king of Judah for all of their wickedness. So when Nebuchadnezzar came, uh, he changed his name to Zedekiah, which means Yahweh is righteous. So his name um, was changed from a gift to Yahweh to Yahweh is righteous. And because of his continued wickedness and idolatry, 
in rebellion against God's command to submit to the king of Babylon, the Lord in his righteous judgment finally casts the nation out of his prom out of his presence. So basically, Nebuchadnezzar is like, Yahweh is righteous, and your name is now going to be Yahweh is righteous. And this came at the time of judgment. So in other words, God's judgment upon you is righteous. Chapter 25. Now it came to pass in the ninth year of Zedekiah's reign, in the tenth month, on the tenth day, of the month that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and all his army came against Jerusalem and encamped against it. And they built the siege wall against it all around. So the city was besieged until the 11th year of King Zedekiah. By the ninth day of the fourth month, the famine had become so severe in the city that there was no food for the people of the land. Okay, so this is the third and final time that Nebuchadnezzar is going to go to Judah, that he came to Judah. And by this time, he was fed up with the kings of Israel. It was like third, the third time's a charm. So this time, he had Jerusalem's total destruction in mind. Um, this time, the Babylonians came. They didn't just make towers. They made siege mounds all around the city. Uh, where basically they could pick off any of Judah's soldiers from the top of the wall. And then when the time came, they could just lower drawbridges and just march right across from their siege mounds into the city. Is that kind of making sense? Okay. So also with these siege mounds all around, um, nobody was able to escape out of the city without being caught and nobody was able to come into the city so there were no supplies coming in or out and after a couple of years there was no more food left in the city and the people were basically weak and starving uh, by this time they had began to cannibalize their kids and basically they were just too weak to fight so the only option they had left if they refused to surrender, was to get slaughtered by the Babylonians. Now, all this is going on. Jeremiah, in chapter 38, he prophesied, saying, Thus says the Lord, He who remains in this city shall die by the sword, by famine, and by pestilence. But he who surrenders to the Chaldeans, to the Chaldeans that is the Babylonians, shall save his life, and his life shall be a prize to him, and he shall live. Thus says the Lord, this city shall surely be given into the hand of the king of Babylon, um, which his army shall take it. So basically, Jeremiah is prophesying to the people saying, listen, in order to live, go surrender to ISIS. Is that making sense? So the princes, the rulers said to the king, to the king Zedekiah, this is all in Jeremiah 38, please put this man to death, for he's weakening the hands of the men of war, the men of war who remain in the city and the hands of all the people by speaking such words to him. For this man does not seek the welfare of the people, but their harm. So they're like, listen, kill Jeremiah. He's telling us to surrender, and that's not for our good. That's for our evil. But remember, God has told them, I'm sending Nebuchadnezzar because he's my servant, and he's going to punish you. So Jeremiah said to the king Zedekiah, thus says the Lord God of hosts, the God of Israel, if you surely surrender to the king of Babylon's princess, then your soul shall live, and this city shall not be burned with fire, and you and your house shall live. But if you do not surrender to the king of Babylon's princes, then this city shall be given into the hand of the Chaldeans, and they shall burn it with fire, and you shall not escape from their hand. He's like, listen, check this out. Don't listen to your counselors and advisors. Surrender to Nebuchadnezzar, and the city won't be destroyed, and you'll get to live. And Zedekiah said to Jeremiah, I'm afraid of the Jews who have defected to the Chaldeans, lest they surrender, deliver me into their hand and they abuse me. 
But Jeremiah said, they will not deliver you. Please obey the voice of the Lord, which I speak to you. And it shall be well with your, you and your soul and you shall live. But if you refuse to surrender, this is the word that the Lord has shown me. So Zedekiah, and it's like if you're reading the book of Jeremiah, it makes more sense. Zedekiah calls Jeremiah in for a secret meeting. He's like, listen, I heard what you said, but I'm afraid to surrender. I got my people on the inside telling me not to. And then there's a whole lot of Jews who have already surrendered to the king of Babylon. And if I go out there, they're going to kill me. And Jeremiah's like, that's not going to happen. If you surrender, you're obeying God and you'll be okay. Is that making sense? Verse four. Then the city wall was broken through and all the men of war fled at night by way of the gate between the two walls, which was by the king's garden, even through the Chaldeans who were still encamped all against all around all around against the city. But the army of the Chaldeans pursued the king and they overtook him in the plains of Jericho. All his army was scattered from him. OK, so Jeremiah told him to surrender. He didn't surrender. Now the wall is breached. When the wall was breached, um, the commanders of the Babylonian army, they just basically came into the center of the city and set up shop. Right now, remember, Jeremiah He's in Jerusalem prophesying to Zedekiah and the people of Jerusalem. But Ezekiel was in Babylon prophesying as well, right? And Zed, uh, Ezekiel is sending his letters to the king, telling him to surrender. But Zedekiah is not listening. In Jeremiah 32, um, 3 and 5, it says this. Thus says the Lord, behold, I will give this city into the hand of the king of Babylon and he shall take it. And Zedekiah, the king of Judah, shall not escape from the hand of the Chaldeans, but shall surely be delivered into the hand of the king of Babylon. And Zedekiah shall speak with him face to face and see him eye to eye. Then, Zedek then he shall lead Zedekiah to Babylon and there he shall be until I visit him, says the Lord. And though you fight with the Chaldeans, you will not su succeed. So, Jeremiah told Zedekiah, listen, dude, you're going to try to fight, but it's not going to happen. And you're going to see Nebuchadnezzar face to face, eye to eye. Then he's going to take you to Babylon. Okay. So, when Zedekiah saw that the city was lost, he had one final escape plan for himself, his family, and the rest of the elites. Really, they had a final escape plan. You regular people, you ain't got nothing to do with this plan. But the Babylonians weren't fooled because God himself was using the Babylonians to hunt Zedekiah down and everybody with him. So remember, Jeremiah's prophesying to him. And Ezekiel is prophesying to him. Ezekiel prophesies to him and sends him this letter. In Ezekiel 12, 12, it says, Thus says the Lord, the king, the prince, that is Zedekiah, who's among the people, shall bear them, shall bear his belongings on his shoulders at twilight and go out. They shall dig through the wall and carry them out at night. He shall cover, cover his face, shall he... Uh, he shall cover his face so that he cannot see the ground with his eyes. But I will spread my net over him and he shall be caught in my snare. And I will bring him to Babylon, to the land of the Chaldeans. Yet he shall not see it, though he die there. Okay. So Zedekiah's escape plan was foiled by God. He thought he was going to get away. And as far as those prophecies coming from Jeremiah and Ezekiel, he didn't believe God anyway. So it didn't matter to him what they said. Plus, as far as Zedekiah was concerned, their prophecies didn't make any sense. 
See, Jeremiah said, Zedekiah, you're going to meet the king of Babylon. You'll speak to him face to face, see him eye to eye. Then he's going to lead you to Babylon, and there you'll remain till I visit you. Right? Okay, that doesn't sound so bad, but it means that I'm going to lose. So I don't want to hear that. But Ezekiel told him this. Uh, Zedekiah, your escape plan is going to fail. And he's like, okay, nobody knows about our plan. Just the rich and famous are going to get away. You're going to be caught in my snare. Then I'm going to take you to Babylon, to the land of the Chaldeans, but you won't see it. And you're going to die there. Okay, so none of that makes sense. I'm going to go to Babylon. I'm not going to see it. And I'm going to die there, but you're going to visit me. I'm getting away. Poor people, you die. So Jeremiah saying Zedekiah is going to speak to Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon until God visit him. And, Zedek and Ezekiel saying you're going to go to Babylon, not see it, and die there. None of that makes sense. Right? Right? Does it make sense? Okay. Verse 7. I mean, verse, verse 6. So they took Zedekiah to the king of Babylon and brought him up to the king of Babylon at Riblah, and they pronounced judgment on him. Then they killed the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes. Then they put out, put out the eyes of Zedekiah, bound him with bronze fetters, and took him to Babylon. So, this happened when Zedekiah was 32 years old. His sons were ranging from infants to no more than 17 or 18 years old. The very last thing Zedekiah saw was his sons being executed. Then he got his eyes put out and dragged to Babylon where God visited him when he took his last breath and died. Basically, the word of God stood true in every single detail. Verse 8. And in the fifth month, this is a month after the city fell, on the seventh day of the month, which was the 19th year of King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. Okay, so keep this in mind. This is... 19 years into Nebuchadnezzar's reign. And the reason why I'll tell you to keep that in mind because we're kind of going to refer back to Daniel a little bit. Okay. Nebuchadnezzar Darren, or whatever his name is, uh, Nebuchadnezzar's captain of the guard, general, a servant of the king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and he burned the house of the Lord and the king's house and the houses of Jerusalem, that is all the houses of the great, he burned with fire, and all the army of the Chaldeans who were with the captain of the guard broke down the walls of Jerusalem all around. Okay, so the destruction of the only city on the planet where God had placed this name was now gone. The temple was completely destroyed. The walls that once protected the city were utterly demolished. And Jerusalem itself was laid to waste. Now you might ask, why would God bring such harsh judgment upon his people and the city and the nation called by his name? And the prophets were asking the same thing. Why are you bringing the Babylonians to destroy us. Remember, Habakkuk was like, God, look at everything going on. God was like, oh, I'm going to do something about it. I'm bringing the Babylonians. He's like, okay, well, we're, we're bad, but not that bad, right? Mm -hmm. Well, in Ezekiel chapters 8 through 10, this is what's happening. The Lord snatched Ezekiel by his hair in a vision by the power of the Holy Spirit. And in a vision, the Lord took him spiritually to Jerusalem and showed him what was really going on behind closed doors in the hearts and minds of the people and leaders who were in Jerusalem. They had set up an idol in the entrance of the temple. But that was just what the general public got to see and participate in. 
when Ezekiel saw this idol at the entrance of the temple, he was like, whoa. And God was like, don't be shocked. You ain't seen nothing yet. Then the Lord told Ezekiel, dig a hole in the wall so you can see what the leaders and elite really got going on. So Ezekiel dug a hole in the wall and went in and he saw inside the holy place of the temple where the priests alone were allowed to be that they had replaced the paintings on the wall, which were supposed to be angels in heaven surrounding the throne of God worshiping. They had replaced those paintings with porno pictures, pictures of bestiality and idol worship. Wow. Now this is inside the holy place. Wow. And the Lord told Ezekiel, don't be shocked. There's more. In Ezekiel 8.14, it says, so the Lord brought me to the door, the north gate of the Lord's house. And to my dismay, there were women sitting and weeping for Tammuz. And he said to me, have you seen this, O son of man? Turn again and you will see even greater abominations than these. So he's inside the temple, in the holiness and in the holy place. And then there's women sitting there weeping before an idol of Tammuz. Okay. Tammuz is the pagan god Ishtar, or as we say, Easter. His mother was Seramis, um, the wife of Nimrod. And this goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 11, the Tower of Babel. Every false religion comes from Babel, Babylon. We're in Babylon right now. So we're dealing with all this. It's all full circle. Anyway... Tammuz married his mother, Seramus. And then he's on a hunting trip. He got killed by a wild boar. She did some sort of sexual thing in the underworld and brought him back to life three days later. And this was the beginning of the mother-son worship. All right. You know what the mother-son worship is? We worship the mother of God. Does it make sense? Yeah. Okay. Anyway, in this worship of Tammuz, every season when plants wither and die, Tammuz dies. Therefore, the first part of the worship of Tammuz begins with weeping for him. However, in order to bring him back to life and cause spring to bring forth new crops, they have idol worship orgies of fertility. And then, of course, babies born from the orgies are sacrificed to Molech. So these women were in the temple preparing themselves for their worship to Tammuz in the place where only the priests were allowed to go. Wow. Then the Lord told Ezekiel, have you seen what the elders of the house of Israel do in the dark? Every man in the room of his idols. For they say, the Lord does not see us. And he said to me, turn again. I will show you even greater abominations that they are doing. Then the Lord took Ezekiel to the inner court of the Lord's house. And there at the door of the temple between of uh, the temple of the Lord, between the porch and the altar, were about 25 men with their backs towards the temple of the Lord and their faces towards the east, and they were worshiping the sun towards the east. So their backs are towards the temple where they were told to face and worshiping the sun towards the east. Now what's funny is Muslims face down, worship face down towards the east with their backsides in the air towards the temple mount. Anyway, after this in Ezekiel chapter 9, God showed Ezekiel the destruction and slaughter that he was going to bring upon Jerusalem. And the Lord told an angel in Ezekiel chapter 9, 
put a mark of protection on the foreheads of the people who are faithful to me and who are grieved over all this idolatry. Wow. But to the rest, God told some angels, utterly, de- utterly slay old and young men, maidens and little children and women, but do not come near anyone who has the mark and begin at my sanctuary. So the angels went out and began to slaughter the elders who were before the temple. And then in Ezekiel chapter 10, Ezekiel saw the glory cloud of the Lord depart from the temple and go back to heaven. Now, when God told the prophets how he was going to deal with his disobedient children, they were blown away and were like, is it that bad? Is there something that we can do to reverse this judgment? In Jeremiah 15, 1 and 3, the Lord said, Even if Moses and Samuel stood before me, my hand would not be favorable towards this people. Cast them out of my sight and let them go forth. For such are for death are to death, such as for the sword to the sword. And for such as and such as for famine to the famine, and such as for captivity to the captivity, and I will appoint over them four forms of destruction, says the Lord: the sword to slay, the dogs to drag, and the birds of the heavens and the beasts of the earth to devour and destroy. Then he told Ezekiel in Ezekiel fourteen fourteen, even if these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it. They would only deliver themselves by their righteousness, said the Lord. Mm. So basically, God was saying, even if earth's most righteous men and greatest intercessors stood together before me, my mind would not change concerning the destruction I'm going to bring because the hearts of these people will not change. So the only people they could deliver is themselves by their prayers. I mean, think about it. You got Noah, Moses, Daniel, Samuel, and Job all praying. God said, I ain't listening. That's what's happening now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. We are totally judged. Anyway, so Ezekiel's in Babylon, and the Lord told him, Why are you so sad and heartbroken over my judgment upon them? Check this out. I'm going to bring thousands of these people from Judah in captivity to you. And when they get there, you'll have a full understanding and you'll no longer be sad. In Ezekiel 14, 14, the Lord said, there will be survivors, sons and daughters, and they will come here to join you as exiles in Babylon. And you will see with your own eyes how wicked they are. Then you will be comforted concerning the disaster that I have brought upon Jerusalem. When you meet them and see their behavior and their ways and their doings, you'll understand that I have done nothing without cause. The mouth of the Lord God has spoken. So Ezekiel's are like, God, it's going to be that bad. And God's like, okay, but wait till they get there. (laughs) <laughs> then you're going to be like, oh, okay, well, yeah, we deserve that. Verse 11. Then Nebuchadnezzar Dan, the captain of the guard, carried away captive the rest of the people who remained in the city and the defectors who had diver- deserted to the king of Babylon with the rest of the multitude. But the captain of the guard left some of the poor and some and left some of the poor of the land as vine dressers and farmers. The bronze pillars that were in the house of the Lord and the carts in the bronze sea that were in the house of the Lord, the Chaldeans broke in pieces and carried away their bronze to Babylon. They also took away the pots, the shovels, the trimmers, the spoons, and all the bronze utensils, which with the priest ministered. The fire pans, the basins, the things of solid gold and solid silver, the captain of the guard took away. The two pillars, one sea, the carts which Solomon had made for the house of the Lord, 
the bronze and all these articles was beyond measure. The height of the of one pillar was 18 cubits. The, the capital on it was bronze. The height of the capital was three cubits. The network, the problem against all around the bronze and the second pillar, the same work with the network. Anyway, you remember when Solomon built the temple, we looked at all that stuff and there was like, he made 12 gigantic bronze bulls holding this giant swimming pool made of bronze. All of that was now gone. Um, and this was the third major deportation of the people of God from the lands, 586 BC. This is when God starts his countdown, the time of the Gentiles, right? This is when, from this point on, the Gentiles are ruling in Jerusalem, or in Israel, or Israel. Um... And this was God fulfilling his promise to Israel that he will vomit them out of the land for their disobedience. Mm -hmm. So with the temple gone, there's no central place for the people to unite and encourage another rebellion. And now the poor people became landowners. And they pretty much didn't have any interest in rebelling against the king of Israel. I mean, the king of Babylon. In 2 Chronicles 36, 20, it says, And those who escaped the sword, Nebuchadnezzar carried away to Babylon, and there they became servants to him and his sons until the rule of the king of Persia fulfilled the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed its Sabbaths. As long as she lay desolate, she kept to fulfill 70, 70 years. She kept the Sabbath to fulfill 70 years. Okay, so of all the idolatry and all the stuff that's going on, God said, you're getting carried away for 70 years because you haven't kept the Sabbath year. Okay, so if you guys remember from Leviticus, uh, once every seven years, God commanded Israel to give the land a rest by not planting or harvesting. They were simply to eat what grew freely. And the Lord promised to bring abundance in the sixth, seventh, and eighth years so they wouldn't have to worry. So basically, they had been in the land for over 800 years, but it totaled up to 490 years of no, no Sabbaths. So 70 Sabbath years, 490 years total seven right so basically what happened is they had intermediate seasons of obedience where they kept the sabbath year and then the rest they ignored it when it totaled 70 years god said that's it is that making sense yeah okay that intermediate obedience Verse 18. And then the captain of the guard took Caesarea, the chief priest, Zephaniah, the second priest, and the three doorkeepers. He also took out the city officer who had charge of the men of war, five men of the king's close associates who were found in the city, the chief recruiting officer of the army who mustered the people of the land, and 60 men of the people of the land who were found in the city. So Nebuchadnezzar, Dan, captain of the guard, took these and brought them to the king of Babylon at Riblah. And the king of Babylon struck them and put them to death at Riblah in the land of Hathma. Thus Judah was carried away captive from its own land. So what Nebuchadnezzar did basically was he executed the remaining members of Congress and the Senate. Because they had been there serving for years without term limits. And with them gone, there was nobody left to stir up the masses and cause problems so that they could stay in their plush lifestyles. Is that making sense? Yeah. He drained the swamp. Good. 
Then Nebuchadnezzar, verse 22, made Gil, Gid, 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 Gadaliah, the son of Ahiakim, the son of Shaphan. Okay, you remember Shaphan? He's the one that found the book in the temple. And he read it to Josiah. So this is his grandson. They make get get Eliah, and he had an evil brother that was one of the priests, and he got killed. But anyway, um, he made him governor over the people who remained in the land of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had left. Now, when all the captains of the armies, they had their men heard that the king of Babylon had made guilt. Gedaliah, governor, they came to Gedaliah at Mizpah, and Ishmael, the son of whatever his name is, uh, of all these people came, and their men, I'm in verse 24 now because I just couldn't say all those names, Gedaliah took an oath before them and their men and said to them, do not be afraid of the servants of the Chaldeans. Dwell in the land and serve the king of Babylon, and it shall be well with you. Okay, so basically, when they found out that Nebuchadnezzar had made Gedaliah the governor of the land, all the people who were still scattered around the country and, you know, the ones that didn't get carried away, they all came to him. And like, okay, they made you the leader, and he's like, obey the king of Babylon. Now, of all the prominent people that Nebuchadnezzar killed and carried away, he left Jeremiah and Gedaliah in Jerusalem. And Gedaliah, he believed Jeremiah and obeyed the word of God and submitted to the chastisement of God under the king of Babylon. And everybody knew about Jeremiah's prophecies because he's been prophesying for almost 50 years. And Nebuchadnezzar liked Jeremiah. Now, remember, this is in Jeremiah's 18th year. He's got Daniel sitting at his right hand. Right? Daniel, by this time, had already told him what his dreams meant. Nebuchadnezzar had already told Nebuchadnezzar what his dreams meant, right? Mm -hmm. Nebuchadnezzar had seen Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego get saved by the fiery furnace. Mm -hmm. And so King Nebi, he wanted to look out for Jeremiah. In Jeremiah chapter 39, verse 11, it says, Now Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, gave charge concerning Jeremiah, to Nebuchadnezzar, Dan, the captain of the guard, saying, Take him and look after him and do him no harm, but do to him just as he just as he says. So Nebuchadnezzar, Dan, captain of the guard, sent someone to take Jeremiah from the court of the prison. Remember, Zedekiah had put him in prison and committed him to Gedaliah, the son of that guy, that he should take him home. So he dwelt among the people. And then in Jeremiah 40, verse 2, it says, And the captain of the guard took Jeremiah and said to him, The Lord your God has pronounced doom on his place. Now the Lord has brought it and done just as he said, because the people have sinned against the Lord and not obeyed his voice. Therefore, this thing has come upon you. And look, I free you this day from the chains that were on your hand. If it seems good to you, come with me to Babylon and I will look after you. But if it seems good for you to stay here, then remain here. See all the lands before you. Whatever seems good and convenient for you to do, go there and do. So Nebuchadnezzar, if you remember by this time, he had already said, worship the God of Israel and nobody else. His second in command is there like telling Jeremiah, all this happened because you guys disobeyed the Lord, but you're free. Whatever you want to do, you can do it. Yeah. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. yeah. Verse 25. But it happened in the seventh month that Ishmael, the son of Nathiah, the son of Elishama, of the royal family, came with ten men and struck and killed Gedaliah, 
the Jews as well as the Chaldeans who were with him at Mizpah, and all the people, small and great, and the captains of the army arose and went to Egypt, for they were afraid of the Chaldeans. Okay, so this dude Ishmael was in hiding. Then he came when he found out Nebuchadnezzar had made Galilee. Anyway, G, the governor. But Ishmael was also a part of the royal bloodline. So he probably figured that he should have been left in charge. And so he assassinated Galiliah and kidnapped Jeremiah and fled to Egypt. Now, when they get to Egypt, and this is in Jeremiah, Jeremiah's continuing to speak to them about following God, and they hated them even more. In Jeremiah 44, verse 16, they responded to Jeremiah saying, As for the word that you have spoken to us in the name of the Lord, we will not listen to you. But we will certainly do whatever has gone out of our own mouth and we'll burn incense to the queen of heaven and pour out drink offerings to her as we have always done. For when we did that, we had plenty of food and were well off and saw no trouble. But since we stopped burning incense to the queen of heaven and pouring out drink offerings to her, we have lacked everything. We have been consumed by the sword and by famine. And then the women said, when we burned incense to the queen of heaven and poured out drink offerings to her, did we make cakes for her or worship her and drink, offers to, drink offerings to her without our husband's permission? In other words, what they were saying is, listen, since we stopped serving the devil, it's been all bad and God hasn't done anything good for us. So we're not listening to you. Stop talking to us about Jesus. <laughs> Anyway, you can read all about that, how God punished them in Egypt for going there um, in Jeremiah chapters 39 through 45. So anyway, all of this, it ties together if, when you read Jeremiah now, right? So if you've read Jeremiah and didn't really connect it to Kings, you're like, what is all this kind of up and down? Okay, now it's making sense, right? And Jeremiah is not put in chronological order he jumps from one time to another time to another time but it's all during josiah to zedekiah right mm. so it should make sense if you read jeremiah now so ishmael killed the dude who god put in place under um nebuchadnezzar kidnapped Jeremiah and a bunch of people and ran to Egypt. And that's pretty much the end of that. Now, remember Jehoiakim, the one that was king for three months and then surrendered to the king of Babylon? Yeah. Right? He's the only king that listened. Why he surrendered, whether it was because he was trying to obey God or because he was just scared, whatever it was, he obeyed God, right? He did what God said and surrendered. So verse 27, now it came to pass in the 37th year of the captivity of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, in the 12th month, on the 12th day of the month, that evil Merodach, king of Babylon, this is Nebuchadnezzar's son, in the year that he began to reign, released Jehoiakim, king of Judah, from prison. And he spoke kindly to him and gave him more a more prominent seat than those of the kings who were with him in Babylon. There were a lot of kings that had got conquered and they were eating at Nebuchadnezzar's table, right? The royal kings that were under, under his, uh, whatever you want to call it. So Jehoiakim changed his prison garments and he ate bread regularly before the king all the days of his life. And as for his provisions, there was a regular ration given to him by the king, a portion each day, all the days of his life. Okay, so there's a legend by the rabbis, not knowing how sure or how true it is. But uh, remember when Nebuchadnezzar went crazy and started eating grass for seven years? Okay, well, his son... Evil Merodach, of course, was kind of in his place. Then when Nebuchadnezzar got his mind back, whatever, he was mad at his son and put him in prison. 
His prison, his son was cellmates with Jehoiakim, and they became buddies. This is the story. Don't know how true it is. So anyway, when Nebuchadnezzar dies, he goes and gets his cellmate and is like, dude, you can sit at the table with me. Is that making sense? All right. Now, even though Jehoiakim was an evil king and only got to rule for three months in Jerusalem, he was also the only king of Israel who obeyed God and surrendered to Nebuchadnezzar. And the Lord kept his promise to him and treated him like a king, even in Babylon. He not only got to keep himself from not being a eunuch, because that's what they did. You know, they made eunuchs out of the royalty. He got to keep his wives. And he had kids whose line went down to Joseph, which is Jesus father which gives him the legal rights to the throne does that making sense yeah. Yeah. okay but his restoration and comfort being cared for by the king that have a that had authority over him was god telling israel i'm your king and i have authority over you and like jehoiakim I will use foreign nations to restore Israel, and I will comfort you. Zedekiah was the last king to rule in Israel when the nation was sovereign, and it would be 2,500 years before Israel became a nation again in 1948. Did you get it? So from Zedekiah all the way to 1948, Israel was not a sovereign nation with its own rule. They were under the, the, the Persians, the Greeks, the Romans, everybody else. And they got kicked out and the Roman emperor changed it to Palestine or tried to change the name to Palestine. All of that for 2,000 years, 2,500 years until 1948. Is that making sense? Yeah. For us, for those of us who know the Lord, and though it may seem sometimes as, as if the enemy has us completely surrounded and there's no hope, it's the Lord who really has us surrounded and the enemy is under his authority. It's just that the enemy is loud with his lies. God whispers once, I got you. But the enemy shouts over and over and over. No, he don't. Even though we may have seasons of intermediate obedience, it's the Lord who will bring us through for his own name's sake. Because of his infinite love that he has for us. And so when the Lord has you dig a hole in the walls of your heart to see what's really going on, it's not to destroy, but to heal. So just embrace the breaking because it's the Lord's restoration. Amen? Amen. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you that you are the healer and restorer and you are the keeper. You keep us when we even don't want to be kept. And so we, we bless your holy name. We thank you. We praise you. Amen. Amen.